Hello and welcome to the Verification Academy and session three of Advanced UVM Modeling Transactions. I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Strategic Verification Architect here at Siemens EDA, and this session will show you the mechanics of building transactions, which are the basic unit of communication between components in UVM. I'd like to thank my colleague Mark Perrier for his assistance in creating some of the examples you're about to see. Let's get started. One of the keys to reusability in UVM is the ability to separate behavior from structure. By structure, we mean the test bench, the environment, and the actual components that are going to be used to verify your DUT. The behavior is the sequences that you're going to be executing and the factory and configuration settings from the test that will tweak things a little bit. The transactions or sequence items are the main communication vehicle across that boundary. So the sequences generate transactions that flow through the test bench to the DUT. The key here is that we decouple the specification of stimulus from the structural hierarchy of the test bench. This allows us to add, remove, or modify stimulus scenarios independent of what's actually in the test bench. Separating things in this way provides us a very simple API for the test writer. If we look at a particular sequencer, we can have a sequence running, and that sequence's job is to define a stream of transactions. You can have multiple sequences running in parallel, and you can have a parent sequence call child sequences. So we may have a sequence that calls S1, which might be some initialization, then S2 and S3 can run in parallel, and that might be the main part of our test, and then S4 can be a cleanup sequence. So you can have sequences calling other sequences. It's important to remember that sequences and the transactions are extensions of UVM object and are all created from the factory, so they're all customizable from the test. So if you want to have a test override a particular sequence to generate error transactions instead of basic transactions, or whatever you need to do, you have that flexibility. In UVM, we use the term transaction and sequence item pretty much interchangeably, but strictly speaking, we use the UVM sequence item type as the base class for transactions because this class includes hooks for the transaction to be used by sequences. In order to use the sequence item properly, we need to make sure that there are certain elements of the sequence item when we design them. So we extend from the UVM sequence item, which is what we typically refer to as a transaction. We register it with the factory using the UVM object utils macro, and then we define all of the information that's necessary in that sequence item to communicate whatever it is that we need to communicate from one component to another. Now there are certain properties of the sequence item that may be referred to as input properties, like the address, the data, things like that. We declare all of those to be rand so that we can randomize the sequence item and all of those fields will have random values assigned to them. We don't show it in this example, but since UVM objects are system Verilog classes, you can include constraints in your class definition as well. There may be other fields that you don't want to have randomized, and these are typically going to be the response fields that get supplied through the operation of the transaction. In UVM, there are a number of methods that we need to define for the transaction so that after it's constructed, other parts of the UVM may interact with this particular transaction through the methods. These are called do copy, do compare, convert to string, do print, do record, do pack, and do unpack. We're going to explain what these methods do and how to create them, but it's important for you to understand that when you actually use these methods, you don't call the do underscore methods. There are equivalent methods, copy, compare, etc., that the user calls, and those cause the do underscore methods, which you define for the transaction, to get called. So let's take a look at some of these methods. The do copy method is responsible for copying the contents of one transaction to another. So we define the do copy method. It's a virtual method like all these are. It takes as its argument the transaction from which we're going to copy. So we call that the right-hand side, or RHS. The first thing we do is we cast that argument to a transaction that we created internally of the appropriate type that we're expecting. If that cast is unsuccessful, it means that we've passed in an improper argument type to the copy method, so we can simply report an error and return. But if it is of the right type, then we need to define exactly what's going to happen. So we call super.doCopy, which means all of the contents of the base transaction are going to be copied into the current class. 
Then we take all the other fields of that right-hand side argument and assign them as necessary to the fields of the current transaction. So they basically all go to this. This is how we define what it means to copy the contents of one transaction to another. When we go to use this, if we have two transactions A and B, we say A.copy of B, which takes the contents of B and copies them into A. This is what we call a deep copy. So if B is extended from other transactions, it will take all of the contents of B, including base transactions, and copy them into A. There's another method that we can use called clone that will create a new instance of type B and copy the contents of B into it. Doing the cast to A allows us to take the contents of B, create a new object with the same contents, and copy that into A. So if you already have an object to receive the contents, you can do A.copy of B. If you don't, you can call B.clone, which will return you a new object of type B with a copy of the contents, and then you can assign the result of the clone to A. To compare transactions, we want to make sure that its contents match the contents of the desired object. So we declare the do compare method to have a UVM object argument called RHS for right hand side, which is the object against which we're going to compare. The second argument is called a policy class, but you don't need to worry about that. It has a default value, so you never need to pass anything into the second argument when you call compare. Once inside the function, we cast the right-hand side to an item of the appropriate type to make sure that we're passing in the right kind of argument. And if that cast fails, then we simply return a zero to indicate a mismatch. We could optionally print an error message before returning, but a result of zero means that there was a mismatch for whatever reason. If we do have the right type, then we want to return a value that means that all of the individual fields of the right-hand side match all of the individual fields of the current component so we call super.doCompare to make sure that the parent class gets compared. And then we and that with the specific comparisons of the individual fields of the right-hand side to the current contents. And notice that it doesn't always have to be an equal comparison. If you're using floating point numbers or something like that, the comparison could be, are we close enough, given that there might be several decimal points or whatever. So it's up to you to define what it means for the contents of these transactions to match. And if they do match, we simply return a 1 indicating to the caller that the right-hand side contents match the contents of our current transaction. Convert to string is useful for printing out debug messages or the contents of a particular transaction. This method returns a string, and we start by assigning to that string the value returned from super.convertToString, which is the contents of the base class, if any. Any additional extensions you make from this base transaction should also call super.convert to string so you don't lose the base class contents. Then we use the sformat system function to take the contents of the current component and append those onto the string that we got from doing the super.convert to string. So we can do whatever we need to do to put the contents of the transaction into the string s, starting with the value of s that was returned from the base class. If one of the fields happens to be an enum, we can use the name method which will return the enum value as a string. We can even have arrays of things, and for each element in the array, we'll walk through and append that value onto the string as well. Then we simply put in whatever other fields are necessary again at the end of the string, and then we return that string. So when we want to use the contents of a particular bus item, perhaps as part of an information string that's going to get printed out, we simply use a.convert to string as one of the arguments to the UVM info macro. That gives you the opportunity to take the contents of that transaction in an easily readable format and use that as a string elsewhere in the system. The UVM includes a printer component that lets you include some formatting that will apply when printing out information. We don't recommend using this functionality since there is overhead associated with it. But if you wanted to use it, the doPrint method is the way to do it. This gets called from the print method of the object, and the UVM printer policy class is used to format the data. We call the print field method to format specific fields, including their name, value, size, and we can define the radix as well. If you don't set the radix, it will use the default. For string fields, we use the print string method. And notice that here, too, we can use the name method for printing the value of an enum field as a string.
For array fields, we start by calling print array header, which tells the printer that an array is coming. Then we loop through the array and print each element using the print field method, and then end with the print array footer method, which doesn't print anything, but tells the printer that we're done with the special array formatting. As we mentioned, the doPrint method gets called when you call the print method on your sequence item object. So here we can see the difference between convert to string and doPrint. As you can see, doPrint provides a bit more information and formats things a little nicer, but you can show all the same information using convert to string, which is much more efficient. Our recommendation is always to use convert to string instead of doPrint. The doRecord method is useful for taking all of the information about a transaction and recording it into the simulation debug database. The first thing we do in doRecord is call super.doRecord to ensure that the inherited members get recorded as well. And the recorder argument is the thing in UVM that's actually going to record the information into the database. For every field in the transaction, we use the UVM record field macro. This provides a simulator specific implementation for how to get that information into the database. In Questa, we use the dollar add attribute system task to do that. Other simulators will have their own implementation. But from the user perspective, you simply call a UVM record field on the different fields, and that will cause the information to be dumped into the waveform database. And again, you can also do a loop to record every element of an array or whatever else you need. Then in order to use transaction recording, you need to turn on the ability to record this information. So we use the config database to set the recording detail parameter for every component. The context argument will either be this if you're calling it from your test or null if you call it from your top level module. The wildcard indicates that this set will apply to every component in the hierarchy and all of that information will get dumped into the waveform database. The other two methods that you need to define are do pack and do unpack. These are not used very often. Sometimes they're useful if you're trying to go from one transaction to another transaction where the types don't necessarily line up exactly. So you want to take all of the contents of one transaction, pack them together into one big vector, copy it over to the other side, and unpack them there into the target transaction. There is more detail about how to define and use these methods in the online UVM cookbook elsewhere on the Verification Academy, and you'll also see these being used in UVM Connect, which you can find both in the UVM cookbook and in a separate video course on the Academy. Now, when we start putting together a system, it's very often the case that we may start with a very basic sequence item type, and we need to make more complex sequence items out of that. So there's two mechanisms for doing that. The first is to use inheritance to extend the bus item type and add more information to it. So here we start with a bus item that's extended from UVM sequence item. It includes a few fields like delay, address, opcode, and data. We can extend the bus item to a new class we'll call my bus item, which will add a few new fields, status and result, and a constraint. Since this is just standard object-oriented programming, my bus item also includes all the fields and methods of the base class too. For the new class, we create all of the methods, particularly copy and compare, that we just talked about, and we make sure that each of them calls super.doCopy or whatever to make sure that the operation is applied to the base class as well. Now, it's also the case that we may need to create a new transaction that includes other transactions as part of it. We call this layering in UVM, and we may want something like a bus item pair that's going to have two bus items in it. So we declare those as RAND so that if we randomize the bus item pair, we'll wind up randomizing each of the bus items. And then through the factory, we can override the types of those so that they may be of type my bus item, the extended type, instead of the base type. So using both inheritance and composition, we can now create arbitrarily complex transactions that include as much information as we need to communicate across components in our test bench. To summarize, when we model sequence items, the key point is that we're encapsulating the information that we need to process any particular operation. So for your application, you need to decide what information you need to communicate between components and encapsulate those fields into your sequence item or transaction, whatever that might mean. Every sequence item has the helper functions that we mentioned that you need to implement. And once you implement them as part of your transaction definition, then you don't need to worry about them. The UVM will just use them as needed. Now UVM does include a set of macros called UVM field macros 
We do not recommend that you use those because there's a fair amount of overhead associated with them and they'll slow down your simulation and make it harder to debug things. When you design your transaction, implementing the helper methods as we showed is not all that difficult and the advantages that you get from debug and increased performance are more than worth the effort in writing those by hand, especially since it's a one-time effort. If you want to create transactions from similar transactions, you can use inheritance. And if you need to create compound transactions, depending on your application, you'll use composition where one transaction can include instances of other transactions. So again, it depends on what information you need to communicate from one component to another. You simply design your transaction to encapsulate that information and how you decide to organize your transaction to represent that information is completely up to you. I'd like to close by giving you a few rules to follow when defining and using sequence items. First, when defining a sequence item, the only thing necessary to specify are the data members that are part of the transaction and the helper methods that we referred to in this session. There are some other methods in the sequence item that you don't need to worry about. They're called pre-do, mid-do, and post-do, and all you need to know about them is not to override them and not to call them. Then when you create a sequence item, you create it via the type ID using the factory. So you say, my item, colon, colon, type ID, colon, colon, create, and you give it a name. That allows the factory to then override that transaction type if necessary. And when you execute items, you execute them using start item and finish item, as we'll see more of in the next session. So if you define your sequence items to include the information that you need to communicate from one component to another, define the helper methods that we talked about, and make sure that when you use these sequence items, you create them from the factory and execute them using start item and finish item, you'll be able to do whatever you need to do for specifying your stimulus. That concludes this session on modeling transactions. Thank you very much for your attention and please stay tuned for the next session on transaction level communication.